And I thought I would start with something which you know much better than myself, which is what do we understand by Parkinson's disease? Well, Parkinson's disease is classically defined uh, by the problems of movement. It's uh, defined pathologically by the loss of a very small subset of nerve cells in this bit of your brain. This is the stem of your brain. These are the hemispheres. And at the top of the stem, there's an area called the substantia nigra. And within the substantia nigra, you have half a million dopamine cells on either side of that structure. And when you've lost half of that, so a quarter of a million, you develop the features of Pogsy. So that's a pretty small population given you've got something like 70 or 8 billion nerve cells in your brain. You only need to lose a quarter of a million and you get Parkinson's disease. So that is important to bear in mind because that obviously has implications about how we treat it and the promise of what cell-based therapies can offer. So that loss of those dopamine cells is what we're trying to do with our cells. We're trying to replace those lost dopamine cells. And we know that should work. And why do we know that should work? Because when we give people dopamine drugs, they do fantastically well for many years. So there is absolutely no reason to believe that if we put dopamine into the brain in, uh, with cells, it wouldn't work as well. So that's what we're going to try and do. Are there any advantages with doing that outside the fact we're just putting dopamine back into the brain in the form of a cell? Yes, there are two major advantages to that. One of the problems with the dopamine drugs we use at the moment is you, when you swallow a dopamine tablet, it obviously works on the area where you haven't got dopamine. In those nigral dopamine cells which project up to the brain, you lose dopamine, it replaces it. It will, of course, replace or work on dopamine systems which you have in other areas of your brain. So one of the problems with some of the dopamine drugs is they change people's behaviour, they can make people see things, they can make people slightly confused, and all of that is because dopamine is working where it's not really needed. So this has the advantage that you can put dopamine into the bit of the brain where you want it to work. The second advantage is if I put dopamine back in the form of a nerve cell, that nerve cell will release dopamine just like a normal nerve cell. When you take a tablet, it gets taken up in the gut, gets taken up into the brain, gets taken up into the nerve cells, and then it's just released. It is not released in the way in which dopamine is normally released. And that has the consequences that after a number of years, the tablets uh, start to behave in a slightly erratic fashion. Sometimes they don't work and people develop the involuntary movements, the so-called L-dopa-induced dyskinesias, uh, which you see in people on long-term therapy, which would be avoided by this therapy. So what we are hoping to do with this is to put dopamine back where it's needed and have it released in a way in which the brain normally releases dopamine. And by so doing, in theory, we should remove the need to take dopamine tablets and you would then remove the need for all those other therapies we have when people have complications from it, such as deep brain stimulation. So this is a study, TransEuro, uh, which we uh, put the grant in for 2008, uh, and it involved Cambridge here as the coordinating centre, which was bringing together patients from London and Cardiff, Paris, who never really got going, Vienna, who looked after the ethics, a site in Germany, and our good friends in Sweden, uh, in Lund. And that set up TransEuro, it's a 12 million euro grant, and it was awarded in 2010. And what we did was we selected the patients we thought would do best, so younger patients, less advanced, with very little in the way of L-dopa-induced dyskinesias, and we collected 150 of these people across Europe who get followed up every six months. We optimised how to prepare the tissue, in terms of making sure we had the right number of dopamine cells and none of these contaminating cells. And we worked out how to transplant it so we could get the cells evenly distributed across the brain. And that took a couple of years to sort all that out. And then what we decided to do was that how the trial would work was that all these patients would be assessed every six months. 40 of them would be randomly selected to go and have some expensive imaging in London, that PET imaging. 20 of those would then be selected to have a transplant. And that would mean at the end of the trial, we'll have 20 transplanted patients, another 20 who've had the same imaging with the expensive scanner, the PET scanning, and another 110 who've been followed up in exactly the same way. We will wait three years to decide whether it's really worked, and we use a number of measures, and importantly, everyone wears a baseball cap when they're being assessed. 
Now, why do they wear a hat when they're being uh, assessed? It's not, a, it's not a fashion statement. It's there so we can video the patient and then we can send the video to someone else and that person will have no idea whether that patient's had a transplant or not because they're wearing a cap so they can't see whether they've had surgery. So that person can then assess the videos not knowing whether the patient's had a transplant or not. So that blinds at some, uh, at some level against the bias. And we are currently here. So we transplanted our first patient in Cambridge in May of last year, and we've now done 10 transplants. So five patients have had transplants on both sides of their brains. So we've done five bilateral transplants. And last uh, Friday, so however many days, that is four days ago, the first patient in Sweden had their transplant. So we've done 11 transplants in 11 months. Now this is a problem using fetal tissue. There are ethical problems. There are also logistical problems, which is why this trial setting it up was always seen as a stepping stone to where we go next, which is with stem cells. And that's where we are now. So TransEuro is active, it's running, and we hope to finish the transplants this year. The future, however, are stem cells because they, are first of all, well, ethically less contentious. I think that is still contentious in itself. There are major advantages with using stem cells in that you can grow these cells in the lab, you can get large numbers of them, you can package them up, and trying to get hold of the tissue won't be a problem. To do a transplant for a patient with fetal tissue, I have to collect at least three to four fetuses where I can dissect out the bit of brain I want, keep it alive for four days in a particular media, and then transplant it. I think we've cancelled uh, something like 17 operations because we've not had enough tissue. So that's a major logistical problem. So that is why this is a very uh, useful tissue in terms of the logistics. The question is, well, which stem cells are we thinking of? And there's tons of these different types of stem cells. So of course, we've all got stem cells in us. Our blood is being replaced every 120 days by stem cells. So there are lots of different stem cells within the adult body and there are those which obviously make up us during development. But I would say there are essentially only two like types of stem cell that are going to go to clinic in the foreseeable future. And if you read about any other stem cells for Parkinson's disease, you should ignore it because there is no evidence that any of those are going to work. So what are the two stem cell sources which I think will go to clinic? The first are these so-called IPS cells. So these are cells, which is uh, a, an invention or a discovery that was made in 2006 by someone called Yamanaka. And he won the Nobel Prize for this in 2012 with our very own John Gurdon here in Cambridge. But what Yamanaka discovered was that if you take an adult cell, so if I took one of you here, I could take a bit of skin. I take a bit of skin and I grow the cells out of the skin called the fibroblasts. I then take those fibroblasts and I chuck on a certain number of factors and I then convert those fibroblasts back to where they began in life. They go back into these pluripotent stem cells, the cells which give rise to every cell in your body. So I've de-differentiated them back to this so-called induced pluripotent stem cell state and then I can drive that into a dopamine cell. So in theory, I can take a bit of your skin, grow up the fibroblasts, turn them into iPS cells, turn them into nerve cells, turn them into dopamine cells, and then I can treat you. So that sounds uh, quite exciting, the so-called IPS route. Uh, it works in rat. You can do it in monkeys. So in Japan, where they invented this, this is what they're really investing in. Uh, you can do this. And then more recently has been the idea that you, not, you can take the skin cells, you can make the fibroblasts, but rather than turn them into stem cells, you can directly turn them into nerve cells uh, by making them induced neurons. So that's very quick, because that works very quickly. So now I can take your skin cells, grow them up in the lab for a couple of months, chuck on a different bunch of factors, and I've got dopamine cells in a week. So that's pretty exciting, and you can do that in Mr. Ratty as well, or mouse in this case. The question you then ask is, that's terrific. I mean, to do that is not straightforward. The cost of that is prohibitive. And ultimately, you'd have to ask yourself, if I take your skin cells, turn them into IPS cells or directly into dopamine cells, but I make dopamine cells, do you really want them back? Because you've got Parkinson's disease, so your own dopamine cells weren't doing so well. So if I'm going to put new cells into your brain, do you really want the cells from you which 
might have some genetic problem as to why they didn't live for 100 years in the first place. So I have problems with this conceptually, but there are real issues in terms of the practicalities of it. So that means I think we're really going to have to work on these so-called embryonic stem cells. So these are the cells which come from the spare embryos from IVF. So when the egg's fertilised, it divides. Once it's divided a certain number of times, you end up eight, 16 cells, and these are the embryonic stem cells. So every single person in this auditorium was at one point in their life an embryonic stem cell. Once you've got an embryonic stem cell, because it gave rise to every cell in your body, you now want to say, can I persuade the embryonic stem cell which I've got to turn into a dopamine cell? And in the last five years, that has happened. So by a group in New York and a group we work with in Sweden, they now have a protocol which allows you to make dopamine cells incredibly reliably from human embryonic stem cells and that they actually work when you transplant them into the rat brain. We can now take embryonic stem cells, we can turn them into dopamine cells, we can transplant them into our animal models, and they work. And they work as well as the fetal tissue when we do those uh, transplants. So we're now at the point where we can make, uh, if you like, from a six well plate, from a six well plate, it's about that big, with embryonic stem cells in it, I can make enough dopamine cells from that to graft uh, five lecture theatres like this. And I can do that with a protocol that takes two and a half weeks. So that is there, we can do that. So where do we go next? Well, the challenge is, how do we do that? How are we actually gonna do that? And one of the things we've tried to do is we've tried to join up all the groups in the world who do this to make sure we do it properly and none of us mess it up like it happened before. So this is a thing which we set up uh, with the Americans and the Japanese and the Europeans. And all of these groups feel that they will be filing for clinical trials in the next two to three years. And I personally think we will be doing a first in human embryonic stem cell dopamine trial in Cambridge in 2018. Now, not only is it important to set up these collaborations to allow us to work towards delivering a clinic at the right time, it's also important that these organisations can then assess the other claims that are out there. So some of you may have seen this. This went pretty viral just before Christmas. So this is a company in America which are doing a trial in Australia. So that should instantly, instantly raise uh, you know, queries as to why they're doing that. And this uh, uh, company have got a pathogenetic stem cell. So this is where they haven't fertilised an egg they've taken an unfertilized egg and made stem cells out of it. And they use that then to say, we're not destroying an embryo, so this is an ethically more acceptable source of cells. They have got ethical permission, they've got regulatory permission to do this in Australia. They've now got ethical permission from the hospital where they're gonna do this, and they're gonna graft 12 patients and follow them up for 12 months. If you look at the papers they cite supporting the use of this, all those animal experiments I told you about, however simplistic they are, have not been done. None of the data shows that they can make any dopamine cells out of these cells. So there is no preclinical data supporting the use of this, and yet it's going to a clinical trial. So we wrote an article, which is freely available in the Journal of Pugsies that came out two weeks ago, questioning this whole approach and trying to get people to critically appraise this type of data. Because if this goes wrong, this trial, it's not only bad for those patients, this will be the end of the field. People will say it's a dangerous field, it doesn't really work with the fetal tissue, this is a major problem and that will be it. So all that work will be wasted. So it's very important that I think as a patient organisation, as patient charities, that you actually critically appraise this and make people aware of some of the anxieties you have with these trials. So what does it cost to treat Parkinson's? Well, these are some figures I put together. So if you look over a 10 year period, L-DAPA costs about £10,000 over 10 years. If you go for a standard dopamine agonist or a Pinarol, it's three times more expensive. Apomorphine, eight times more expensive. Deep brain stimulation actually is not very expensive. It just costs an awful lot to have it in the first place, which is what everyone sees. But over 10 years, it's not too bad. Duodopa, where you have it put in the small bowel, over a quarter of a million pounds. So that is serious bucks for that. For our transplants, it costs £23,000 to have two transplants and a year of immunotherapy. So our stem cell transplant will cost that just to deliver it. 
So the big unknown will be, actually, who's going to ultimately own this? Because when I finish my phase one study, we do a phase two study, someone's going to have to invest in it and buy it and take it. And ultimately, whoever buys it will determine the price. And that, I think, again, is where the patient groups can be so important about uh, if this really works, making sure that the price doesn't become something which stops you from having it. And the final thing I'll say before I wrap up is that this whole approach has told us how we might be able to repair the brain with Parkinson's disease using cells. We're at the exciting point where we're about to move forward with stem cells. One of the um, observations that's been made in this field is that when some patients died 10 years or more after having a transplant from unrelated causes, they looked at these transplants and what they found to their amazement was that these fetal dopamine cells, which are only 10 years old, have got Parkinson's disease in them. Very small numbers, didn't affect how the transplant worked. But the question is, how could a transplant of such young dopamine cells have acquired the Parkinson's disease pathology? And so this raised the idea that the protein which causes Parkinson's disease, alpha-synuclein, has got into the transplant and started to cause problems inside the transplant itself. So that the pathology of Parkinson's disease has spread and infected the transplant. And if that's true, that the alpha synuclein, the protein that lies at the heart of it, is spreading, can we stop that spread? And that has led to this huge revolution in the idea of using vaccines and immune therapies to kill off alpha synuclein and stop the disease in its track. Now, none of these are mutually exclusive, so you could see in the future people come along with Parkinson's, have a transplant, have an injection of a vaccine. Thank you very much. I'll disappear now and won't trouble you uh, with my neurological problems ever again. So to finish, where are we stem cell therapies? I think we need to understand that this, this treatment is not for everybody because we need to be careful how we use it. But if we do that, we will get much better results and know how to go forward. There are lots of new therapies that are out there, but we are getting to clinic with stem cells and they will be coming to clinic, I'm quite sure, in the next two or three years. You need to be aware of what's out there. If you want to have a stem cell transplant for Parkinson's tomorrow, there are several hundred clinics around the world which will offer you that. They will uh, liberate you of somewhere between five and $25,000 uh, and there is no scientific basis for it. So this is a field which is fraught with danger because people are not doing what I've tried to describe tonight. And there are new therapies that come along and these new therapies which were new in the 1980s which we're still working with have thrown up unexpected results which have totally changed where we've gone with respect to our thinking on Parkinson's disease. I'm currently taking part in the TransEuro research. What that's involved so far is psychometric tests, uh, tests of mobility, as well as remembering lots of long strings of numbers and uh, addresses and letters and things like that. Four out of five may have a problem with their swelling. That means that their quality of life is going to be reduced. And we hope that this is going to change. 